At this time, can sergeants, can you please start your recordings? Computer recording on the way. Cloud started. Backup started. Thank you very much, Sergeant Jones, when you're ready. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to today's remote New York City Council hearing of the Committee on Aging. At this time, would all panelists please turn on their videos? To minimize disruption, please place electronic devices to vibrate or silent. And if you wish to submit a testimony, you may do so at testimony at council.nyc.gov. And again, that's testimony at council.nyc.gov. And thank you for your cooperation. And Chair, we are ready to begin. Thank you. Good morning. I'm Council Member Margaret Chin, Chair of the Committee on Aging. And I thank you for joining us today's Zoom oversight hearing on the future of senior home delivered meals. Before the COVID-19 pandemic, it was estimated that about 1 million New Yorkers were food insecure. However, recent report claims that this number may have doubled due to the current crisis. While food insecurity affects everyone, our seniors are especially vulnerable. New York City's Meals on Wheels report that one in 10 older New Yorkers face hunger. This statistic may be even higher due to the current trend that we are seeing citywide today amidst the COVID-19. To help combat senior food insecurity, as well as keep seniors safe from COVID-19, New York City's Department for the Aging, or DIFTA, has revamped its food providing services in recent months. In March, DIFTA requires senior centers to transition from in-person congregate meals to grab and go meals. For safety, DIFTA then stopped its grab and go program and switched to a centralized home delivery program run out of the agency called DIFTA Direct. Finally, in May, DIFTA handed over its food providing services to the Get Food NYC program operated by the Department of Sanitation. Despite all of these changes to the traditional congregate meals, there weren't any noticeable change or adjustment made for homebound seniors participating in DIFTA's home delivered meal program. In fact, currently, while seniors participating in the Seniors Get Food program are able to receive three meals per weekday, homebound seniors participating in DIFTA's home delivered meal program continue to receive just one meal per day. One meal a day. You would think that the population that has already been identified as having the highest level of food insecurity would receive the most, or at the very least, the same amount of support as their counterparts. It is simply not acceptable that the city has been failing our food insecure seniors, especially during a global crisis. At senior centers, I witnessed seniors eating half of their meals and save the rest for later. How do we know that some seniors are not doing the same at home with their home delivered meal? I urge DIFTA to conduct a client survey of his home delivered meal program to see if the meals that they are providing are even enough. We must ask ourselves, are we only doing enough to keep our seniors alive? Or is there more we can be doing to increase their food security? I also want to note longstanding deficiency within the home delivered meal program, especially 
with the reimbursement rates of meals. The council's fiscal, fiscal 2021 response to the preliminary budget called on the administration to adequately fund the enhanced need for senior services such as meals. We noted that the, senior, the city's $9.58 reimbursement rate for senior meals is 20% below the national urban home delivered meal average of $11.78 per meal. Providers <clears throat> have reported that this reimbursement gap in existing contract forces them to run deficits ranging from $40,000 to $100,000 per year in order to meet the full need in their communities. We have to do more to support our senior service providers as they do the vital work of feeding our seniors. Thus, going forward, DIFTA has a lot of work to do. DIFTA will need to consider how to properly fund and expand the home deliver meal program while making the program sustainable for nonprofit senior service providers. DIFTA will also need to envision the future of the program, including what kind of culturally competent food should be offered, how to eradicate the waiting list, and how to expand the program to include food insecure seniors who are not connected to the department. DIFTA needs a better plan to help feed our food insecure seniors. And I'm looking forward to hearing what it will do to revitalize and improve home delivered meal for our seniors. We will additionally be hearing resolution number 112 sponsored by council member Ulrich regarding including halal meals as part of department of the aging DIPTA sponsor home delivered meal program. I'd like to thank the committee staff for their help in putting together this hearing. Our council, Nusar Chadari, policy analyst Kalima Johnson, finance analyst Daniel Krupp, and finance unit head Johanna Sapora. I would also like to thank my legislative associate, Harmony Dahl, and legislative and communications director, Kana Irvin. And I'd like to thank the other member of the committee who have joined us today, Council Member Diaz, Council Member Ayala, and Council Member Vallone. And I also wanna thank all the sergeants uh, for helping the hearings today. Now I will turn um, it back to our policy analyst, uh, Kalima Johnson for further instruction. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Chen. I am Kalima Johnson, Senior Legislative Policy Analyst to the Aging Committee of the New York City Council. I will be moderating today's hearing and calling on panelists to testify. Before we begin testimony, I want to remind everyone that you will be on mute until you are called on to testify. After you are called on, you will be unmuted. I will be calling on witnesses to testify in panels, so please listen for your name to be called. I will be announcing in advance who the next panel will be. I would like to remind everyone that, unlike our typical council hearings, while you will be placed on a panel, I will be calling individuals to testify one at a time. Council members who have questions for a particular panelist should use the raise hand function in Zoom. You will be called on in the order with which you raised your hand after the fill panel has completed their testimony. We will be limiting council members' questions to five minutes. This includes both questions and answers. Please note that for the purpose of this virtual hearing, we will not be allowing a second round of questioning. For panelists, once your name is called, a member of our staff will unmute you and the surgeon at arms will give you the go ahead to begin after setting the timer. Please listen for the cue. All public testimony will be limited to three minutes. At the end of three minutes, please wrap up your comments so we can move to the next panelist. 
Please listen carefully and wait for the surgeon to announce that you may begin before delivering your testimony as there is a slight delay. I will now call on the following members of the administration to testify. Commissioner Lorraine Cortez Vasquez from the Department for the Aging, Kate McKenzie, Director of the Mayor's Office of Food Policy. I will first read the oath and after I will call on you individually to respond. Commissioner Cortez Vasquez, do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth before this committee and to respond honestly to council members' questions? Yeah. Kate McKenzie, do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? I do. Thank you. Commissioner, you may begin when ready. Uh, Commissioner, before you begin, it's yes. great to see you. I just wanted to acknowledge that we also been joined by Council Member Deutsch. Thank you. Wonderful, thank you so much. Um, good morning, Chairwoman Chen and the members of the uh, AG Committee. For the record, I am Lorraine Cuesta Vasquez, the Commissioner of the Department for the Aging. Last month, I testified on the important subject of the future of older adult sentiment, uh, particularly after COVID-19, including a, a reopening plan. And as discussed, which was discussed and remains ongoing, collaborative, and guided by public health authorities. Today, I appreciate the opportunity to discuss yet another important topic, the future of the older adult home delivered meal. In times such as these, it is important to remember and reemphasize the mission of the Department for the Aging, the undercurrent of which always included health and safety. Did the work to eliminate ageism and ensure the dignity and quality of life of New Yorkers' diverse older adults and for the support of their care caregivers through service, advocacy, and education? To that end, DIFTA is deeply committed to assisting older adults so they may age safely in their homes and remain actively engaged in their lives and their communities. DIFTA's priorities became even more critical during this public health crisis. Chief among them are combating uh, food insecurity among older adults and the uh, chairwoman mentioned how some of those were effectuated maintaining social engagement for tens of thousands of senior center members, which I discussed at length in last month's hearing, but I will again repeat some of the salient points, and securing uninterrupted access to critical services for older homebound individuals. As previously discussed before this committee, when senior centers closed, it's now over seven months ago, did the work to quickly transition our congregate meals operations to ensure that center members can continue to have access to a daily meal. Emergency Ex Executive Order uh, 100 closed congregate sites in March and public health recommendations necessitated meal se uh, service operations to quickly shift as the uh, chairman uh, announced earlier to a grab and go model and then to a centralized delivery system called DIFTA Direct, which eventually merged into the city's broader food insecurity initiative, Get Food NYC. Meanwhile, DIFTA's traditional home delivered meal during the course of this pandemic, as the chairwoman said, remained unchanged. And it remained unchanged and separate and apart from Get Food NYC so that we would have no interruption of service for these vulnerable older New Yorkers. And to ensure continuity of service, that was key. Prior to the pandemic, on any given weekday throughout the city, approximately 18,000 homebound older people received a home delivered meal through DIFTA's home delivered meals programs. Unlike older adults who participated in daily congregate meals uh, services, um, any older adult receiving home delivered meals must meet, one, must meet one of the following criteria set by the New York State Office for the Aging. And they are unable to meet a congregate, unable to attend a congregate meal program 
because of an accident, illness, or frailty. The lack of formal or informal supports that can regularly provide a meal. They are unable to provide meals due to the lack of adequate uh, cooking facilities, a lack of knowledge or skills to prepare meals, or the inability to safely prepare a meal, to shop, or to cook. And most importantly, the ability to live safely at home once meals are provided. A principal goal of this program is to support an older adult living in their homes and staying in their communities for as long as possible. Through its network of dedicated home delivered meals providers, DIFTA currently delivers 4.5 million meals annually to homebound frail older adults. The provision of a meal to a frail older adult helps to secure their nutritional needs and are met, that the nutritional needs are met in order to promote overall health and the ability to live independently, live independently in their community. Each contractor is responsible for delivering meals in a predetermined geographic catchment area of the city of New York. And each area comprises a group of community districts, something we're all very familiar with. The Home Delivered Meal Program is formally connected to DIFTA's case management program. Case management agencies are the entry points at all in-home services. The CMA performs, I will call the case management agency going forward, the CMA, they perform in-depth assessments of social, psychological, cognitive, and the physical well being in order to assist clients to live independently again in their community. If a client is in need of a home delivered meal, the CMA is responsible for determining eligibility, initiating the service, authorizing the client for a meal, and sending a referral to the local home delivered meal program. The CMA is also responsible for determining if the older person is capable of managing the receipt of multiple meals once or twice a week in lieu of a hot daily meal and advising the client on the availability of meal choice so that the client can then decide what option is best for them. The home delivered meal accepts the referral and begins providing meals to that older adult generally between one to three business days later. Again, from the onset of the pandemic, DIFTA worked very closely with the administration and Get Food to preserve the home delivered meal program intact. Uh, and they were not transferred into Get Food. Uh, the one and only exception is that if a current home delivered meal provider had reached its service capacity, a newly under uh, identified homebound older adult seeking um, home delivered meals would be transferred uh, to temporarily and enrolled into Get Food NYC to address their immediate food insecurity. The future of home delivered meal in January, a following a concept paper that elicited comments and responses from providers, advocates, elected officials, and other key stakeholders, both in writing and through a various, uh, various meetings, DIFTA released a request for proposals, an RFP, for its in-home delivered meals program. The RFP was released just prior to COVID-19's public health crises. Several extensions were granted to proposals, totaling a 20, uh, 22 weeks of extensions, to allow for more innovation and partnerships during this period of COVID, and also to uh, in submission um, in response to the submissions to the RFP. Following a, a six month period from the release date, DIFTA received more than 130 proposals for 22 home delivered meal contracts. The RFP demonstrated DIFTA's commitment to continuity and to continuing to provide nutritious uh, needs for the vulnerable older adult while also evolving the home delivered program that had been in place for over 16 years with an eye towards the future. While the needs of the older adult clients remain paramount, enhancement within the RFP endeavor to also provide greater ease and flexibility to contractors who provide these meals. This was all 
things that emerge from the concept paper and the meetings that were held before the RFP. The RFP encouraged high quality and regionally sourced food, meal types, choice. That was a very important feature to the older adults, hot, frozen, and fresh chilled, and daily choice, and the environmental sustainability. Many of these elements are values set forth by the Center for Food for Good Food Purchasing, which the administration has been working towards implementing citywide. Ultimately, DIFTA sought to fund programs that were able to address three overarching goals of the RFP program. As I said earlier, the first was choice. The RFP defined choice to mean the opportunity for each meal recipient to choose a meal and type of their liking. DIFTA will be requiring uh, contractors, uh, contractors to offer several uh, cuisines in different meal formats. Diversity. All meal uh, recipients must also have the option to receive meals, five meals a week from cuisines associated with the prominent cultural groups of their catchment area, such as Halal, Latin, Spanish, Polish, Chinese, Caribbean, Korean, Russian, or Mediterranean, depending on the catchment area. Meal recipients must also be able to select the kosher meal of their choice if they choose to do so. Finally, at least one vegetarian dish is also required in the proposed weekly meal offering. Quality. DIFTA will assess the quality of the meal experiences through periodic taste tests conducted by uh, quality control measure. Additionally, as part of the Good Food Purchasing Program, food quality will also be measured through annual assessments of food purchasing. And one of the other issues that we talked about was to get a scale through good food purchasing and, and uh, collaboration. In order to propose and operate a program that fully addresses these three element, elements, DIFTA strongly encouraged proposers, proposers to critically evaluate their own organizational capacities and strengths and to consider uh, establishing formal partnerships as a way of, of leveraging resources, stru uh, structures, group purchasing um, for meals, and, I mean, for food, as well as other products and other strengths that other organizations can bring to their organization. The subcontracting and the use of MWBEs, minority and women-owned business enterprises, in partnerships was strongly encouraged. DIFTA also encouraged proposers in collaboration with the case management agencies to provide directly or indirectly targeted social interaction and support for clients who request it for those deemed at higher risk of becoming socially isolated and for those deemed medically frail. Because of the timing of this RFP, proposals were able to leverage key learnings from the pandemic and apply them to many of their submitted proposals. For example, based on lessons learned in the past few months, vendors proposed strategic delivery options and, and uh, certain planning, including state-of-the-art software and applications to ensure efficient and flexible delivery routes, something many of them did not have access to before. Proposals also reference frequently reviewing and updating emergency preparedness and business continuity plans, proposed mandated wellness training for staff, um, and also Finally, in an effort to respond to future crises, proposals mentioned forming innovative and non-traditional partnerships. Based on the enthusiasm and responsiveness of our current contractors, compounded by the number of submissions of new proposals, we are confident that this RFP process has resulted in a network of home delivered meals providers with practical and operational skills to successfully serve nutritious, culturally appropriate home delivered meals for homebound New Yorkers and bringing us into the future who require this critical service for many years to come. DIFTA recently announced the responsible proposal, recently announced the responsible proposals who proposals had the highest technical score and was deter and had been determined to be the most advantageous to the city taking into consideration the factors and criteria set forth in the RFP. Such uh, uh, criteria included increasing meal options for recipients, 
uh, for recipients, increasing the availability of culturally aligned meals and promoting uniformly high quality made food made from good food. In conclusion, I would say we are proud of the solicitation and procurement process, the long solicitation and procurement process. We lodged earlier this year for home delivered meals program and are confident in the abilities of the awardees selected from an increasingly comp a competitive pool of quality, high skilled and talented home delivered meals vendors. Moreover, the insights and lessons learned by these awardees from the pandemic will further ensure, especially the technological routing and delivery uh, technology that we've been applying will definitely uh, ensure a successful and long lasting program and can effectively serve homebound older adults for the duration of this pandemic and of course for the post COVID future world that we're all waiting for. With great interest and enthusiasm, DIPTA looks forward to seeing these proposed services and innovations come forth to fruition and to aid and benefit some of New York's most vulnerable older New Yorkers. I thank you for your time and, and for your consideration and welcome questions that you may have. Thank you, Commissioner, for your testimony. We will now turn to Chair Chen for questions. Thank you, Commissioner. I am going to start with a couple of uh, general questions and then I'm going to uh, ask my colleagues who have questions, uh, give them an opportunity to, to ask. So, Commissioner, you know, with a possible second wave of COVID-19 pandemic approaching, what step is DIFTA taking to ensure that we are prepared to deliver meals to seniors throughout this winter? Uh, I wanna just remind people that existing contracts are in place till de December 31st. New contracts will not start until January 1st. So there is time to pivot and transition to new contracts. We have about two, two and a half months to do that, right? And um, so that if this wave comes sooner, our contractors, current contractors are fully prepared to continue the service that we have. And during that month of December, we will be working on transition. You know, at the, uh, at the committee's um, hearing in October, uh, which is last month, uh, we talk about the future of the senior center and you testify that DIFTA and Get Food conducted a survey of 73,000 older adults that asked a variety of questions related to their interest in receiving meals. Um, can you share the result of the surveys? Um, and also, can you provide this information um, disaggregated by zip code and council district? The survey was initiated by Get Food. Uh, there was a survey of, uh, and, and we will work with Get Food to get you the information that you may need. And I will defer to uh, my colleague, Kate McKenzie's uh, testimony and her response to that at a later point today, this morning. Uh, what I also will give you is that we have conducted a survey of a uh, several uh, older adults, and many of the things that we looked for was the type of meal that they were interested in, um, the frequency of the meal that they were interested in, and things of that nature were part of the community survey. The other issue that we were uh, looking at in terms of some of the outcome of that and our community survey, one of the things that we were looking at was access to food, proximity in terms of geographic proximity. Also at the uh, last month's hearing, I know we had a, a lot of discussions about you know, getting centers to reopen. And I remember, uh, Commissioner, you mentioning um, November 1st that you would love to start the a grab and go program. And I've talked to some providers. Um, they were also involved in your uh, task force and they were prepared and looking forward uh, to do that. So I just wanted to know that have there been any progress made uh, in terms of this topic and that you can share with us? 
So I want, first of all, thank you. November 1st, November, November 1st was the date that our former food czar had initially uh, cited as a possible transition date. Things have changed dramatically since then. Um, and I use that opportunity to say the first week of November was a date that we were using purely for planning purposes of reopening. And I am still hopeful. Um, not, I don't think that the first of the first week of November is a possibility, but we continue the pro, uh, planning process. But I always have to start with the value statement that the safety of older New Yorkers is our top priority. And any decision to be uh, to reopen is going to be guided by public health authorities. However, we remain determined to have meetings and planning sessions with our providers in the event that there is any change so that we can know exactly what the milestones are that we need to do to implement programming. Uh, and those conversations continue. No one is more uh, looking forward to this possibly than the pro uh, providers than I am. We have been enthusiastic about bringing the provider network back into the food service. Both the city is looking at that as well as, um, as the Department for the Aging alongside this network of providers that have continued to serve uh, older adults during this pandemic. So that priority continues, that process continues, that date is a shifting date, and that date is shifted every day by new public health information. Okay, I know, because some provider would say, well, maybe November 9th um, would be the date. No, that and... was the date we were using. That's exactly <laughs> the date we used as the target date. You know, like, let's say, let's plan, because one of the things, a chairwoman, that the provider said to us, you cannot, we cannot do this on a one week notice. If we're going to open at any point, regardless of the methodology of food uh, service, we need to have two to three weeks notice. And that is why we've been planning out this process that now every day looks less and less hopeful that it'll be in November or December. Well, <laughs> Commissioner, you and I agree that the providers uh, have to get back um, in the game. Absolutely. They have to get back in providing the nutritious quality food um, to our seniors. And I think that, yes, you know, we agree that the safety of the senior is paramount, but I think, you know, the, uh, the health expert, they need to talk to our providers. The providers know what to do. When I saw some of their plan, I mean, they worked it out. They know how to keep the seniors safe. And also for our senior, the seniors that go to the senior center, they're active seniors, a lot of them, they know how to keep their, themselves safe. They're the one that's wearing the mask. They're the one that's still doing social distancing. So I really urge the health department, meet with the provider and talk to them. Look, we started opening up restaurants with certain guidelines outdoor dining, indoor dining with a lesser capacity. Our schools are open. So I think that we gotta really look at our senior, um, that there are active seniors who need the socialization, who can come and do grab and go. Uh, and they've been participating in a lot of the virtual program. And we, we're gonna be talking more about that uh, in upcoming hearings, uh, but you know, Talk to the provider. Health department yeah. needs to talk to the provider. Chairwoman Chin, I want to reaff reaffirm the total alignment we have, you and I, the network, as well as my colleagues in Get Food, of the importance and the value that the network brings to food uh, provision and food security. We're working tirelessly with the network. Uh, the de department is working tirelessly with the network and we work with our colleagues across the city to keep exploring what possibilities are there to engage the network. So that I, I don't want to ever give the impression that it has to be this one date. We are all constantly thinking, talking to look forward to uh, what strategies can we employ that will bring the network, the people who know older adults the people who've been serving older adults, 
who the people who know their communities and every need in that community to bring them back into the fold. And I, I'm telling you with total sincerely, and as I said in my oath to give you the truth and nothing but the truth, we are working on that regularly to come up with some options. I, I thank you for that. I, I think that you know the Home Deliver the Meal program, we take care of the frail elderly that cannot participate. Uh, they cannot go out to participate in the Congress Meal Program. But we have so many active seniors um, that can, go out and really participate, whether you're doing grab and go or outdoor dining, whatever. They are doing grab and go in, from the school for, right. their, for their grandkids, for, for their family. So I just don't wanna have the stereotype of people looking at older adults are all the, the frail elderly. There's so many different types of older adults and there are a it's lot of active. <laughs> <laughs> and there are a lot of active ones that could play a good game of ping pong. Uh, so I, I'm just going to stop for a minute and really uh, pass it on to my colleague to see if they have some question and then I'll, I'll come back. Thank you, Chair. I will now call on council members in the order they have used the, raise, the Zoom raise hand function. Council members, please keep your questions to five minutes. The Surgeon at Arms will call We'll keep a timer and we'll let you know when your time is up. We'll be starting with Councilmember Vallone, followed by Councilmember Ayala. Councilmember Vallone? Starting time. Good. All right. Thank you. Good morning, Commissioner. And good, good morning. morning to my colleagues and our amazing chair, Margaret Chin. I mean, I think, as always, Margaret kind of, the, the most important part is the restart of services and, and getting back to what our local providers and our seniors are used to. And I think we're all still struggling with this new world. So while we're in it, we're doing our best because it's probably the number one call in our office for the amount of uh, seniors and those who are dependent on DIFTA for, for, for decades of their lives, um, trying to guide them through this new world we're in. So, I mean, with that, we're, we're just, and I know you had said where you're, you're looking forward to as much as we are as to getting back to that type of provider service. But I guess it was around May that we that DIPTA stopped enrolling the clients in May and instead referred them to get food. And I know you said that's still active today. Um, what what can we what can we expect? I know you mentioned with with our chair that you don't have a date yet, but is there a, are we going to continue for the balance of the year with that? system do we plan on sometime soon switching back to the providers doing the service or what do you envision with get food so the best way that i can answer that and then i think the question in more detail can be answered by my colleague kate mckenzie but i can say to you um with full clarity that the get food prob uh, program was started because of a pandemic it was an emergency and is an emergency response so as this emergency continues we will have that in place because there's been a commitment to combat food insecurity, not only for older adults, but for all New Yorkers. And I think anything deeper as to the next steps in the future of Get Food, but I can tell you it was started because of the pandemic and it will continue for the, because of the emergency response and it will continue as long as the emergency can, uh, exists. Okay, so before we switch to someone else though, so if, if it's gonna continue and it looks like there are numbers that, you know, scaring all of us, whether it's going up or not. So it's probably gonna continue for the foreseeable future. What, what's the next step? So if someone comes through and then gets onto the Get Food Services Program, I mean, obviously in the past, if I were to call you or someone were to call DIFTA and their provider, there are services beyond the food aspect that the senior also needs, right? So if that were to occur, and now a senior uses or requests additional services, whether it's um, uh, at home services or mental health or medical services or anything that DIFTA provides, how is that handled? Is that also handled through the time the Get Food or process starts or and how does DIFTA involve now when there are additional services that's an required? Excellent, that's an excellent question and I think it really requires clarification. So okay. the beauty of this design really it, it was, thank you for the, for the question because I think many of us 
many people, not us, not uh, miss the importance that the network, the aging network, the senior center providers, this network of congregate providers, the beauty of this process has been that they are the trusted enrollers for Get Food. So the entree to Get Food is through this network. And during that process, they will identify other needs that this person may have beyond the immediate food insecurity because they are the senior center providers. More than likely, they will be put into the battery of wellness calls and, uh, and contacts and also into the battery of the other and be given the information on all of the other services that are available for them, whether it's- So it's at the local point. So it's at the local point of contact then. It's at the local point of contract. Some people obviously come in through 311, but to enroll in the program, it goes back to these trusted enrollers, which the lion's share of them are the network itself. So, so that, we, since we're in that, so we're in this brave new world and that's working, how, how does DIFTA then sort through that new data? Is that kept, kept through um, for the type of services in the portal that we used to provide, right? And we'd have a case management system and we'd follow through um, on that, you know, I, it's tough for us to kind of de delineate between now, where is that information? Does that come some through DIFTA is still managing the so, overall so they're, person? They're, great, another great question, really. <laughs> I tried. <laughs> uh, there is a central database that is kept by Get Food on all recipients, right? And then there is a central, there's a database that is for the 60 plus. That database is also constantly uh, reviewed and meshed and uh, aligned with DIFTA's database so that we have access not only to what we consider a council member, the I'm legacy fine. clients. Okay, can, Ch Madam Sorry. Chair, can I just finish with that, those last couple of questions on this? Thank you. All right, so what we will do is with the legacy clients, we know who they're associated with. With the new clients, what we're doing is looking at those clients and start to determine, can they be affiliated with a, a, a center? And so right now we're in the process of how to serve additional, uh, provide additional services to those non-legacy clients. And legacy so I guess that's clients, the key, right? Yeah, that's, that's the key the right key. there. So that's do the you have, right and I, I know I, I like to always stay within the time, so we'll kind of wrap up and it's not a second round, so maybe, Margaret, you can follow through on this too, but on the legacy versus the new, do we have a percentage of how many new seniors and or clients have been started from the time that the transfer to get food started so that we have a handle on, on how many versus the legacy that are already existing versus the amount that are in the new? The number to be, the number fluctuates regularly on both ends. So the, the legacy client, that number has decreased. We're looking at the reasons for that number decreasing. Um, and we're also looking at some of the factors as to why the other ones. And a lot of it is choice uh, for those who had lived independently before. So we can, uh, we can get back, we can follow up and get you There time is absolute get. data on those numbers. I don't have that available right now, but I will I commit to get that number to you. And then my last question on that, because it's the same type of pattern. So if, if that has started, do we have the data on once that new, I guess, portal has started, do we have case management files being handled as DIFTA did in the past for legacy and the new ones, or are they being separated? Is there a separate world now between? So case management, is an entree point so as an entree point so case management deals with legacy and new so that well, is that is a con right that's a constant that's a constant source of entree into any in-home services or other major services that you may find yourself with so that's case management but I, what i can give you is some data now that will give you a sense that this is not a forgotten group of people in new york city to date we've done about two million wellness calls and of those wellness calls, about 1.5 1, 1. million have been done by the network. So that means that that difference is probably for people outside of, of the network. And that is, you know, that is sort of like a data point to see how many people are still being engaged, at least in wellness calls, and they're not a forgotten uh, group of people. Okay, thank you, Commissioner. Thank you, Madam Chair, for the extra time. And I know there's a lot of good information there, so we'll follow up with you on that. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Vallon. Now we'll be hearing from Councilmember Ayala. 
starting time. Good morning, everybody. Good morning, Commissioner. I hope you're having a good morning. <laughs> yes, I am. Good. Thank you. I lost you on the monitor. Everybody keeps this is like a tic tac toe. Everybody this moves. This is around. our new world. Sometimes we see things. <laughs> sometimes we don't. Like the Brady Bunch. Um, it's, I just really have a, a couple of questions. I, well, I have some concerns about, and I know that this is not necessarily DIFTA, but I wonder how much DIFTA weighs in on the Get Food program. Um, one, I have concerns about the, um, obviously still the quality of the, of the meals because I get a lot of complaints from uh, seniors, including my mother every day uh, who hates the, the quality of the food. So she's very selective about what she eats. and. Um, you know, considering that the city has such a huge cash flow issue, you know, it's really alarming to see how much waste, right, um, is produced while we're trying to make the effort to do the right thing, right? And so there's a lot of really good intention in this program. However, um, I'm not sure if DIFTA has an opportunity to weigh in, considering that there are so many people that may have been referred to that program, um, and not necessarily have, have been a participant of the, the, the home delivered meal program at one point. So I'm really just, you know, concerned that, that those people that really needed these meals are not necessarily getting them because they're saying, you know, still, we're still seeing cases where food is, you know, delivered mm -hmm. and left in the lobby of the building um, with no name. So, you know, um, do you, does DIFTA have an opportunity to weigh in on that? We work very closely with our uh, colleagues that get food to work on all of the issues of, uh, centered around the 60 plus. But for the operations and some of the remedies um, and mitigations that get food, as I think the one who can answer that best is my colleague Kate McKenzie when she testifies. Um, and um, but I, I know for a fact that we have a very close collaboration and in the with the goal to make sure that meals meet the nutritional values of the 60 plus and are supportive. Yeah, I, I mean, I remember I, when I used to work in the in the senior center was many years ago, and I mean, we had, uh, I mean, the same the same foods that I ate at home, we 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 served at the senior center, right? Uh, was the, those were the good old days, and then the nutrition um, requirements changed drastically. And with that, you know, came, you know, food options that weren't necessarily culturally sensitive uh, or appealing, right? Most of us didn't recognize what was in front of the plate. And so um, I think that that's kind of what I'm seeing, you know, and I, I like to interrogate my mom just to kind of get, you know, a sense of what exactly it is that she's, you know, not liking. And, um, you know, I've heard of cases where people have like tried to give the food away and nobody will take it because, it's just, they just don't like it. So um, I think that, you know, I, I don't know. I think that we missed an opportunity to maybe survey the seniors or the individuals that are, you know, that have access to these meals to get their perspective on, you know, ways that we could improve the program. Because the, again, the goal is really to ensure that people are, you know, the most vulnerable people have access to meals uh, several times a day. So I would, cons I would seriously, you know, consider uh, the idea of, you know, some sort of survey to get that feedback. Um, I know um, Chair Chen mentioned, you know, maybe um, feedback from providers, right? Because they have uh, a more hands-on approach and they have their own ideas. But I think that we forget uh, to ask the question of the recipients, right? Like, what are they receiving? Because the provider, you know, they, 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 they're, they're great, um, but they're also gonna comply with whatever the, you know, the requirement is. Um, but they're not the ones that are eating the food, right? Um, and we want to make sure that people are actually eating it. Um, so um, so I, the, my last question is really regarding the, uh, so, so of the individuals that were referred to get food that should be considered for home delivered meals, is there a plan to transition them over at some point once uh, the get food uh, meal program is over or is this a Kate question? It is, um, it is a temporary, uh, it is a temporary assignment to get food. This, I'm talking about home delivered meals. I want to be very yeah. specific about yeah. that for the vulnerable elderly. It, it's a temporary assignment. Um, it's it's really about provider capacity to the extent that that, that you know because a home delivered meals is a fluid process. To the extent that the provider capacity increases, then they can be shifted back to a traditional uh, 
a home delivered meals provider. And we don't know yet when that would happen, right? We know that that constant shift is, uh, is, goes on on a regular basis. Oops, time. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, I think um, Director McKenzie is here to answer question uh, from the Get Food program. So maybe, uh, okay, can you address some of the question that was raised by uh, Council Member Ayala in terms of uh, food quality and also um, I think a question earlier about uh, transitioning, um, you know, seniors, um, senior center provider uh, yeah. to be able to start uh, providing the nutritious meal again. Yes, thank you. And so thank much. you for being here. Yeah. Of course, thank you, Chair Chin. Of course, to my uh, colleague, Commissioner Cortez Vasquez, for your for your leadership and support through all of this, and to all the um, council members and and their staffs on the call today. Um, uh, you raise, uh, Councilmember Ayala, some very important points, and I want to assure you that we have been surveying and receiving feedback, certainly from, um, from elected staff such as yourselves, as well as some of the providers who I'm sure you'll hear from later today, um, who are enrolling seniors. Um, so something of note that I want to um, ensure that everyone understands is that we have just transitioned um, from the, uh, the vendors that have been providing meals over the course of the pandemic to 30 new vendors who's, um, once all of those contracts are registered, they will be uh, shared with everyone specifically to provide prepared meals. And that is in um, after direct feedback um, that we've been hearing from seniors that that is what's desired. And so we also are ensuring that the nutrition standards are even more enhanced than what they had been over the course of the last several months. So those two items of um, prepared meals, actually there's three items, prepared meals, enhanced nutrition standards, um, and also ensuring that there's more cultural and ethnic um, options available are in direct response from feedback from people such as yourselves and your constituents. I will also say, the fourth item is that we have um, changed the configuration of the deliveries from nine meals delivered at one time to six, again, in response of direct feedback that we were actually providing too many meals, which is um, we certainly don't want to ensure, don't want to contribute to any food waste um, at all and want to make sure that we're uh, getting meals directly to people that need them most. The other um, uh, modification that will be happening um, is that all of the, the TLC component, right, the, that we stood up tremendously quickly back in March and April, um, we are now doing what's called a vendor direct model because we've gone from a height of serving about 320,000 New Yorkers a day to I believe last week we served um, 86,000. So because of the decline, which is good as the city's reopening more and more people are able to get out, we're serving a vendor direct model. So the same providers who are preparing those meals are also responsible for the delivery of those meals. So again, the intention here is that all of those challenges, then I respect and appreciate all of the work that TLC did um, and know that this model perhaps will ensure that that meal gets um, with even more accuracy to the doors of, of New Yorkers in need. So I appreciate you, you raising that. Um, I also, uh, Council Member Vallone, you mentioned um, some questions about the numbers. I'll let you know that, um, again, using last week's statistics, there were 50, uh, roughly 54,000 people in the um, Get Food program, of which about 18 and a half thousand were those legacy clients that uh, you and Commissioner Cortez Vasquez had described. Um, and so we're, again, ensuring that um, all people are served with the best service and um, appropriate meals for their needs. Um, and then finally, Chair Chin, I wanted to address your questions and the conversations around senior center providers. And you know, something that, um, you know, when I was in graduate school 20 years ago, I did my thesis actually on meals served in senior centers. Um, and I so appreciate and have just been re uh, reminded about how central senior centers are to the lives of New Yorkers. And I, um, I can't wait for the day that senior centers can come back to be able to serve in a congregate setting um, or even a grab and go setting to ensure that, that 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 social element is there and the familiarity of meals that seniors relied, have relied on is there. 
unfortunately that time is just not right right now. We know from after conversations with Dr. Varma and with the health commissioner that they all aspire to that, but the time has to be right with public health guidance. So I don't have a date for you, but again, echoing my, my colleague, Commissioner Cortez Vasquez, they are hounded every day with, um, with uh, you know, questions about when is that time going to be? And we wanna make sure that we are doing that in a time that is sound and safe for, for our, our older adults. Um, so I wanna pause there, but again, thank you so much for your attention to these issues. And um, in partnership with the Department for the Aging, Get Food will continue to serve all New Yorkers um, to ensure that they're not uh, unnecessarily going hungry. Yeah, um, thank you, Kate. Kate, when you talked about the uh, 18,000 legacy um, clients at Get Food, does that mean these are the the senior center clients uh, yes. that goes to senior center. I thought that number, commissioner, I thought that number should be higher because uh, it, senior center, right, serve what, about 30, 30 something thousand, 37 thousand? Senior centers <laughs> traditionally served anywhere between 21 and 25,000. And as, as Kate and I have both mentioned, that number fluctuates on a regular basis. Yeah. Um, thank you, Commissioner. And, and Chair Chin, I would say, you know, again, after, um, you know, trying to stay in touch also with the tre tremendous network of authorized enrollers, many of whom are those providers, you know, the conditions or the criteria for Get Food are ensuring that, you know, you have no one to get meals for you, you cannot afford a private delivery service, um, uh, and, and um, you're not receiving another meal. So our, you know, some of our assumptions and proved out in conversations is, you know, some people are finding that their friends or their family can help to bring meals home. And that's attributing to some of that decline um, from a height, I think you're right, you know, where it was upwards of, of 30,000. So we're monitoring that very closely. But as of last week, we've got about 18 and a half thousand of those legacy clients who are still continuing to receive meals through the Get Food program. Okay. Uh, I just wanted to acknowledge that we've been joined by um, Council Member Traeger. So Kay and, and the commissioner, uh, I know we, we talked about earlier, you know, wanting to get um, the senior center provider back in the game. So what is, uh, it's also Get Food working uh, with DIFTA to see how we can start uh, doing that transition. I mean, if it's not grab and go to begin with, can the center uh, provider uh, still be able to cook the meal and then work with get food uh, to do the last step of delivery or provide resources uh, to the provider so that they can uh, do the delivery themselves? Because some of the providers uh, are also part of the home delivery meal program. So they do what they call Meals on Heels. <laughs> and so they already are doing that. Um, and I remember them talking about it in the beginning that it wasn't that they could, couldn't do the work. They just need more resources to help uh, with the delivery. So is that a model that at least we can get back into? If we don't do grab and go, can we get the center to cook and then deliver the meal. Sure. I apologize for that. I think it was someone reminding me to vote, but I've done that this morning. Um, <laughs> so I wanted to let you, um, I, I really appreciate that line of questions. And if you could take a look at, at the at call, at the um, commissioner's um, staff and my calendars, you would see just how, how often we are talking about what you just described. Um, you know, I appreciate from the early days back in March um, when, when the program was transitioning um, in the first phase, you know, senior center providers are so extraordinary at what they do and that is in that meal provision, right? The challenge here is that last mile delivery and so I do know that one, um, I believe, Commissioner, it's Riverdale, 
Riverdale Senior Center um, uh -huh. is actually um, on the uh, a vendor now for Gap Food. They have, um, you know, their their um, uh, bid uh, and and proposal was accepted, and they're they're one of the providers that um, that is able to serve um, and meet the, the all of the scope of work that is outlined in that solicitation. Um, I know that I'm working closely with Lorraine's colleague Michael. Um, Agna Benny and, and, and several other staff to just see how creative we can be to resource providers in this effort. But that challenge of, of delivery is, is what it is, it's a challenge. And so we're trying to think about how we could make that happen um, in a way that certainly um, leans into the extraordinary um, work that the providers can do while you know, realizing that we aren't ready for grab and go so we've got to ensure that the food is ultimately getting into the homes of, of those that need it. I, I want to just echo that we were, as Kate mentioned, if you look at our schedules, there's more conversations about planning together and moving forward and being as creative as we possibly can be within this combine, confines of this pandemic. And um, because we're all aligned with the same mission. Well, we're going to be continue pushing because the, the provider, the senior center provider, they, as you said earlier, Kay, they know the, the seniors, the familiarity, and they're ready. They're ready. So I just don't want them to be left out. I mean, they've been doing great, you know, with the wellness call, with virtual programming, and there's so many fantastic things that's happening uh, with our center. And they're ready to prepare the food. Uh, and they know what our seniors like. Uh, so I think that uh, I hope, you know, the conversation continue and we will continue to uh, advocate. I know my colleague have some more questions. I mean, Councilmember Barlow, if you have some questions, we can, or, and Councilmember Ayala or Traeger, we can go a second round uh, while we have uh, the commissioner and Kate here. Councilmember Barlow? Yeah. Yeah, no, I, I, you caught me off guard. I thought there wasn't going to be a second round, but I, I think just on following up with uh, the first line of questions, I just think if we can get the numbers, I guess, so we can help follow up with uh, the chair and the rest of the committee on the amount of seniors now that are utilizing services beyond get food that are the legacy versus the new classification uh, how that those services are being provided now that they're in this new category. And one of the rallying cries that Margaret's always had is the uh, amount of case management files per DIFTA worker. So I think there's a, a avenue there that we can follow up to try to help DIFTA in this new world of the seniors that are enrolled through Get Food versus seniors that were enrolled uh, through the providers separately. So I guess, Commissioner, you had said you can get us the data on the new on the new seniors that are part of that program. Are you finding that that flow of information is coming through to DIFTA now, now that it's coming through these, I guess, a different type of portal versus the get food versus the previous portal? Um, once we get the client data, we then compare that to the previous um, portal. In, in addition to program and process, we do a lot of data sharing with Get Food and with the Get Food team and also system sharing so that we can constantly have a sense of these um, new, new entrants into the world of senior services, all right? And that's the, what's the best way I can describe it now. The other thing that I can tell you to that, uh, we will get you those numbers, Council Member Ballone, and we'll also give you some, um, some uh, data on the type of services that some of them may be currently receiving, all right? To the extent that we have all of that data. What I do wanna say also is that the network of providers, as, Mike, as Kate has so well said, as, the, as the, the chairwoman know, and everyone in this, the network of providers are the key partners in all of this. And they're very much interested in also getting the data of the non-legacy or the new entrants um, 
uh, older adults who have not been affiliated with senior services. They too are interested in getting that data to see which ones that they can uh, reach out to and absorb. So there is a very conscious effort in this city from DIFTA, the network, as well as our partners in Get Food, who also have this data, on ensuring that that individual is not just then uh, left unaffiliated and untapped. So how is, I guess, who's coordinating with the nonprofit providers now that there is this new system with Get Food? Or is there a daily, a weekly update on hearing from their concerns and or? I meet, I meet with the providers once a month by borough. Um, and we discuss all of these issues in addition to the hopeful reopening. But we also talk about service issues. We talk about data complexities and any of the current issues. And included in those council member below was this new group of individuals that we've identified in New York who now raise their hands and say, we need services. So what do you, I guess, what would be your summary of that? What, what are the nonprofits, I guess, biggest concern at this point under the current model? Is there anything that is the, the, the menu item think, of the day, so to speak? I think, I think the, under the current model, you know, the issues that, that some of the council members have raised are some of the concerns and issues of the current model. The, uh, the other current uh, issues that they have is capacity. You know, do they have the staff capacity because it's virtual, but do they have the staff capacity to sustain, you know, those wellness calls and issues uh, and with this new increased population? And I think another concern that we all share, um, DIFTA was set up to serve uh, about 300,000 uh, individuals usually in, in, in a year. And now we're talking about upwards of about another 70,000, 80,000 who have raised their hands as a result of COVID. And how is it that we can build that, that kind of expanded capacity? That coupled with the increased population of older people. Um, so all of those issues are issues that we're looking at regularly with uh, internally with our colleagues in government and also with obviously with the network. I guess the last would be, I guess they, the nonprofits have not been left I'm uh, with the same crisis that we are with the financial crisis. So many of them across the state are on the verge of, of going under. So one of the things that uh, Madam Chair has always asked for is an increase in the reimbursement rate. And I know that uh, it's currently, I think, at $9.58. And we were hoping to bring that up $2, like to $11.78. With the current crisis, has there been any thought of adding into this year's um, proposal or budget for the increase in the reimbursement rate for the nonprofits? Well, the way I'm, the way I can answer that right now is that in the new RFP for home, we're talking about home delivered meals, council member. Yes, yes. Um, in the new RFP, we issued, we had a rate of 958, and of the 130 responders. Uh, they all came in uh, at the rate of nine, nine, I mean, 958 from my lips to God's ears, but um, $9 and 58 cents. Um, and we, uh, all of the providers came in at that level. And I understand, you know, the study that talks about the $11 per meal, uh, but that doesn't include or factor into the city's ability to achieve major benefits through economies of scale. So I think that that is a, a major factor, but the current RFP came in at $9.58 and the 130 who applied did come in at that price point. Okay, so I know that's always something where we, you know, listen, we're trying to advocate and help to you also. So it's it's the combination of trying to get the, the, the yeah. administration to hear the budget needs. And I, I would just follow up, I guess the question you had said that you're meeting with them monthly, just, just know that we're hearing from the nonprofits that the calls that they were usually expecting and, and appreciating have stopped. So the briefings, I guess, whether they're weekly or monthly, um, have in a way they used to continue in the past. So there may be a disconnect there somewhere, but we, there we should probably There must be a disconnect, follow. but those meetings are held monthly by borough. And sometimes we collapse two boroughs, like sometimes we'll do Brooklyn and Queens together or Manhattan and the Bronx together or Manhattan and Staten Island, but uh, those meetings are held religiously 
nothing has stopped. In an but maybe it's the phone. Maybe it's the phone call updates. I don't, is there something? Is it just something about maybe you used to have a weekly phone call or a monthly up phone call besides the meetings I, I'm that not, were helpful I'm not, during the pandemic? Yeah, no, I'm not sure. I'm not sure what what they're referring to, but I can tell you the meetings that do occur. We have a monthly borough meeting that I chair, not staff, that I chair with providers by borough. In addition to that, we have two work groups the eternally optimistic reopening work group um, and that we're working on details of what would be required to reopen, whether the model is grab and go or the various models that we've all discussed this morning. And then we have another work group that's called the future of senior centers to look at thinking current state as well as future state because this city is evolving and the needs of older adults are evolving. So we're always looking at uh, the future of, of senior center. And those are two very large work groups with large participation. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you, Madam Chair. Let's just, I guess we'll just find out what, what the phone call that was so essential because that's always a key resource for me, uh, uh, right. making sure we have that update. Maybe it's beyond the meetings, but thank you very much. You're welcome. Yeah, thank you, Council Member Hello. Um, Commissioner, you know, as you were talking about the working group, uh, due to the uncertainty uh, with the future of the senior centers uh, during a pandemic, many of the providers and advocates and myself have been calling uh, to push back the RFP on senior centers. So what do you think about that? I can share with you that senior centers have been in place as we've known them since the early 2000s and before that, so we have not had any changes in the model. And what I can say to you is that older adults in New York City have changed very much. The needs, the complexity, the age range, the geographic location of older adults has changed dramatically since the early 2000s and the, and the seven years before that when was the last time an RFP was done. So if we're going to be looking at meeting needs, and that is what our commitment is for all of us. If our, we're looking to look at needs, we need to be forward thinking and the way we can introduce new concepts and uh, new visions of service, as well as accommodations for this growth of older adults is through an RFP. We are a legacy organization. We're a change organization. We wanna be a forward thinking organization. Um, we will work with the providers, but I think that an RFP is the way that we could really make sure that we're prepared. And this network that is so committed to this population is best prepared to address the future. Okay, I mean, we're gonna continue to push uh, for a delay because of the increased population that we talked about we last always... month, uh, because I think you, uh, said earlier that um, the portfolio provides services to what over thirty thousand seniors or twenty uh, anywhere between twenty one to twenty five thousand, and uh, and then we had another about twelve thousand that were newly identified. This is in common, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. And then, but with the get food program, uh, I remember last month you talked about almost another additional 40,000 senior signed up that were not connected to senior center. I'm so not there, sure what the number is, but I will refer to, to, to my colleague, but, um, but the number is somewhere around, I believe uh, Kate had mentioned earlier, 53,000 uh, for, is that the 60 plus population, Kate, or that was all? Last week, there were 54,200 seniors of which 18 and a half Right. Thousand were um, the legacy clients. Right. So that's okay. an additional 30,000. Yeah. I mean, if we got, I, I think the number was higher last month <laughs> um, when, uh, when Commissioner, you were testifying. Because it fluctuates. I mean, yeah. But still, that's, a, that's almost double the, the, the legacy client right. uh, seniors right. um, that are out there. And so I think that, and this population, it's going to continue to grow. So I think that's why, you know, the, the RFP uh, need to have sufficient funding and also look at how to 
incorporate all these new seniors. I mean, I have a hunch that a lot of those seniors are seniors that should be connected uh, to senior centers, but they were the group uh, that was attracted by those uh, private social adult daycare. And they were not in operation during the pandemic because we've gotten calls from uh, these private social adult daycare and their coalition complaining about not getting reimbursement from the MLTC. And I was like, why are you calling us? <laughs> You're under the state. But remember, uh, Commissioner, there were over 300 some of them that registered with DIFTA, right? And they yeah, are they're, abandoned they're, uh, those seniors. They're 337 um, SAGs. And of those 370, we have uh, 271 have registered with us. Yeah. And they and abandoned that's, us. And that's thanks to, thanks to the uh, local law nine that the I city know. council imposed. Yep. And we're still trying to crack down on them. Uh, I mean, there are nine good ones that are supported by the senior uh, city council and work with DIFTA, but a lot of them, they abandoned the seniors during this pandemic. And luckily there was this gift food program that these seniors were able to connect. So we see as an opportunity to get these seniors back, who was like, you know, they were lured away by all these benefits. And, and when a crisis happened, they were abandoned. So we just wanna make sure that uh, we continue uh, to support them. Uh, I wanted to go back to the, the, the home delivered meal. Uh, I know that council member Valong talked about um, the reimbursement rate. And I know that you're gonna be negotiating uh, with the organization that was, um, that awarded the contract. I hope that you will uh, provide us uh, with a list uh, of the people of the organization that got the, um, they got the award and their um, subcontractors and, uh, and how many of this group are new contractors and how many are the uh, original contractor that, was, um, that were already uh, providing the home delivery meal program. So we look forward um, to seeing that list because um, I, I didn't see all the subcontractors. Because when you talk about the diversity and the culturally sensitive meal, uh, it really didn't show um, in the list of the people who got the highest score. But I assume it will be the subcontractors who are, who are going to be doing that. And I think that Councilmember Valong and I, you know, we talked about it in the past many, many times. We were hoping that some of the so some of the subcontractors were able um, to become prime contractor, but I don't think it happened this time around. So um, I think we, we have to continue to look at how we support um, subcontractors who are providing the culturally um, ethnic meals uh, in the community and make sure that we help them uh, build their capacity. And that's something that I'm not sure we, we saw it in this RFP. In this RFP, one of the key points, uh, Councilwoman Chin, uh, diversity and the ability to address cultural and religious needs was a key factor. What about the, um, the status uh, of the funding? Was, that, was the 2.84 million, the one shot um, was eliminated? And what was the impact on that cut on the home delivery meal? I will have to get back to you on that because the RFP included all of the, the budgeted uh, amount. Uh -huh. Was there like the, uh, was there any kind of federal funding that came in uh, to support the home delivery meal during the pandemic? Yes, we have federal, uh, thank you for the question. Uh, we had $3 million that we, well, we had about $27 million that helped us during the uh, pandemic. 
and uh, of the three million dollars went to home delivered meals programs to support the increased demand. As you know, and I reported last testimony, and I continue, is that there's been an increased demand for uh, in-home services, including home-delivered meals. And so that money has been allocated to, um, to the provider through December 31st. Do you have the number of the um, increased demand in the home-delivered meals? That yes, I, I can give you that number. Um, the number that we're we've seen an increased demand, and that number also has fluctuated. Um, and we're looking into that. There was an at the highest point sometime in April and May, there was about 3,600. In September, that number reduced like to a that was a 20 percent overage by uh, se uh, by September, that number reduced to seven percent which was about 1,200. And now in, November, in October, that number went down to 5% overage, which is about 900, 960. Good. Um, I think with the, uh, you know, Kate talked about with the Get Food program. I remember early on, you know, people were getting a lot of the prepared meal and the uh, shell stable meal and people were complaining it was about the shell stable meal. Uh, that considering a meal. And I think she mentioned that from nine meal, nine prepared meal now is gonna go down to six prepared meal. So commissioner, get food is providing six prepared meal, but the home deliver meal program is only providing five home deliver meal. So uh, uh, do, we, do we know, you know, like serving um, the client that that is sufficient? So I'm going to answer that two ways, right? Um, one way is that the case management agency looks at that issue very carefully. The other thing is that we provide six meals because we provide a weekend meal. Um, so that they are six meals as well as emergency meals for home delivered meals uh, clients. And some programs do provide an addition like a light breakfast or some supplemental uh, snacks. So, uh, yes, uh, we are providing one meal a day, but that has been part of the uh, case management process. Yeah, I think it would be good to really look at um, serving um, these clients and, and from the case management to really see what the real needs are. Whether yeah, you know one, one meal one meal a day is sufficient, or like if they're like breakfast, or um, I know that we fought for money. Uh, for the sixth meal um, in the council. Uh, Councilman Mokosko was, was instrumental in, in pushing for that. And I think that, you know, we really do need to find out what the real need is so that we can, you know, advocate for sufficient funding. So the, you know, the most vulnerable senior, the one that depends on home delivered meal, uh, you know, get um, the food that they, they really need and not just you know, one meal a day and, and we think it's sufficient and, and it might not. There's seven days in a week. So I think we really need, need to um, take that into uh, consideration. Um, does uh, other council members have questions before I... Council Member Ayala, do you have any follow-up questions? Okay. I did not, thank you. Oh, okay. You know, in July, we heard that there was a wait list uh, for clients in Staten Island needing the home deliver meal. Is there still a wait list? And can you also give us if there's a wait list citywide for the home deliver meal? I, I just gave you the numbers. If there is no wait list for home delivered meals, um, to our knowledge, as we, as a case management agency, uh, looks at a client and home deliver and meal is part of the case plan because they have food insecurity, that client is then referred to get food and get food, as I mentioned earlier, will pick up that client temporarily oh, until, the, okay. until the provider has capacity. Okay. 
Oh. I'm just looking at see any other questions. Um, Do you have any idea why the, the number uh, of seniors needing meals went down? Um, from, which meals? From 30, from 30, 600 to 900 in a handful of months? It could be a variety of things. It could be as uh, one choice. It could be for home delivered meals. It could be through an assessment for a case management agency. That's one of the things that we're looking at right now are when people are being taken off the home delivered meals uh, program. In this, uh, in this RFP that, uh, that Jeff did for home delivered meal, um, you did not take into consideration of uh, medical, you know, tailored meal. I know that one of the nonprofit, you know, God's love we deliver. Um, they do a great job in terms of delivering meals to seniors who just came out of hospital with certain illness, and it's they've been, been supported. They've been supported by the council, but they are not part of the uh, DIFTA's uh, home delivery meal portfolio. Is there a way to um, include them because it's such a, a great program and, it, and it's such a great need? Um, I don't, I can look and see if they apply for the home delivered meals program uh, and see what the status of that is. I don't have that information in, uh, available to me right now. Okay. I, I don't, I didn't see their name in the, in the big group. I don't know if they're able to uh, be part of a subcontract group. Um, I think, you know, it'd be great if they can also get into uh, DIFTA's portfolio because it is one of the organizations um, that have been historically supported um, by the council. And they provide an excellent service. They're an excellent provider, an excellent operation. They started out as a service to AIDS and now I've walked to medical needs. It's, they're an exceptional organization. Yeah. Will also a cost escalator be built into the contract? or does the administration expect provider to remain whole uh, as food costs rise in the future? That is a question that we always look to together in partnership with OMB and also with our city council partners. <laughs> I know you always look towards partnering with the council, right? Council member of alone, like we always <laughs> help you fight for more funding. <laughs> And we will continue, uh, continue to do that. I know that we have uh, a lot of providers and, and people waiting uh, to testify. I know there's so many questions. We may not have gone through all of them, but we will definitely. Uh... Oh, wait a minute. Uh... Is it true that some seniors have been told that they will no longer uh, get beyond the get food uh, program because the vendor isn't renewing their contract? Uh, I actually, yeah, Chair, Chair Chan, if you, I, I'll take that question. I actually spoke with yeah. Alvin Nickerson this week, particularly on that issue. As I mentioned, we've transitioned from some previous vendors to new vendors. And there was an issue with a provider who it, it, I think the um, the recipient and then the the, the provider was misinformed. The pro, um, that particular vendor was saying that they were no longer going to continue as a vendor, and it was interpreted as the program is ending. So, oh, okay. So I, we we straightened that out. Okay, that that that's good to know because like uh, we don't want a seniors to be scared and then all of a sudden that's that they they're right. going to be dropped to out of the program. I wanted to respond to that just and nip that in the bud because that's absolutely mm -hmm. not correct. So right now we have no definite uh, timeline in terms of when the, when the Get Food Program will complete its mission and transfer 
everything back to Dukta. You, when this, when we are committed to ensuring, um, you know, I, my office will continue to ensure that the coordination of the emergency food programs um, is maintained throughout the duration of the pandemic. I wish I had a deadline on when this pandemic was going to end, um, but we're, we're in it um, to continue to ensure that no New Yorker needs to um, experience unnecessary food insecurity. Are there any problem with um, seniors and or clients that are at the on the get food program in terms of having to re-register? Um, yeah, sure. Thank you for that question. These authorized enrollers are extraordinary, um, and and you know it is. I want to underscore it is in an emergency program um, that we are looking for FEMA for reimbursement for. So need to ensure that people are always. Um, you know, just checked that it is truly an emergency program. So I know that some providers have um, been uh, concerned with the two week re-enrollment window, um, but that is, you know, to, to maximize our potential for FEMA reimbursements. And we open, we may, we're trying to make that easier and less time mm -hmm. consuming, um, but I just appreciate, um, um, I appreciate the, the the challenge and the time that they're spending to ensure that you know they're helping New Yorkers to to get those meals. But that is the rationale for it. Okay, I mean I'm glad the meal is improving, and then you have more uh, diversity, more choice, and uh, so hopefully going forward, um, the seniors will be provided with more nutritious meal. And we're still looking forward. Uh, to having our nonprofit senior center providers um, back in the fold, that they are the one that's going to be cooking the meals and utilizing, you know, their their kitchen facility, and we just have to provide the resources for them. If they can't do the delivery, then provide the last step uh, to help them. And I really look forward, um, Commissioner, uh, to seeing that uh, happen. Um, so we had other questions that we might not have an opportunity to ask and we will forward them uh, to you, Commissioner, and to you, Director. Uh, and then we look forward uh, to your response. And we thank you for uh, joining us this morning and thank you for all the great work that you do for our older population um, in our city. And hopefully we all pray that this pandemic uh, will go away as, as quickly as possible. And hopefully yeah. the change in Washington <laughs> <laughs> will help us. God help us. Let's vote. Got it. Yes, and please go yeah. out to vote and urge all your families. Right, I put it on so that friends. people can see it. It says vote. Yeah. Um, I wanted to just make, before I leave, thank you very much for this. Thank you, Kate, for being a, par a great partner with us. We just, one little correction, the program that is currently part of Get Food is Greenwich House. Um, and I wanted to just put that for the record, the correction, all right? Um, so thank you again all very, very much. And it's been an honor to spend this morning with you. Oh, I didn't know that Get uh, Greenwich House was part of, were they yeah. the, one of the new vendor that just yeah. joined? Yeah. Oh, okay. So hopefully, yeah, the centers under them uh, will be able also to benefits too. Thank you Great. for that question. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Uh, Thank you all. I'll pass it back to our policy analyst, Kalima, to call the, the next panel. Thank you, Chair. We will now turn to public testimony. Once more, I'd like to remind everyone that unlike our typical council hearings, we, be, we will be calling individuals one by one to testify. Council members who have questions for a particular plan list should use the raise hand function in Zoom and you will be called on after each panel has completed their testimony. For panelists, once your name is called, a member of our staff will unmute you and the surgeon at arms will give you the go ahead to begin. After setting the timer, after setting a timer, all testimonies will be limited to three minutes. Please wait for the surgeon at arms to announce that you may begin before delivering your testimony. The first panelist will be Caitlin Andrews from Live On New York, Tara Klein from United Neighborhood Houses, and Kevin Jones from AARP. 
We will first begin with Caitlin Andrews. Starting time. Thank you, Chair Chin, Council Member Ayala, Council Member Ballone, for the opportunity to testify today. My name is Caitlin Andrews. I'm the Director of Public Policy at Live on New York. Live on New York's members include more than 100 community-based nonprofits that provide core services that allow older New Yorkers to thrive in communities as they age. With our members, we work to make New York a better place to age. First, we want to thank all of the uh, nonprofit organizations that have stepped up during the pandemic to provide critical services to older New Yorkers. And we would like to focus our testimony on the financial needs of home delivered meals, nonprofits, particularly as we go into this new um, contract period. This is really important as recently a, an analysis done by Candid found that 1,829 nonprofit organizations might go out of business across New York due to financial strain from the COVID crisis. We cannot have New York City exacerbating this by paying nonprofits rates below what they deserve. So what does that mean? We need all contracts to fully fund the indirect cost rate initiative. This was an initiative set out by the administration that has recently um, come under uncertainty and is not there is not a commitment right now to fully fund this initiative moving forward we need to ensure that these future contracts have the full icr rates included we also recommend that dipta reimburse providers for the true cost of a meal and fulfill all contractual obligations associated with this program a great start to that would be following the line of questioning of council member Valone to increase rates from nine dollars and 58 as proposed in the rfp to eleven dollars and 78 which is the national average for a home delivered meal. So that means we're almost $2 below the national average for a home delivered meal in urban areas. We also need cost escalators and cost of living adjustments in this contract and all non nonprofit contracts for the city. Knowing that raw food costs will go up, salary increases are necessary for this predominantly female workforce. Um, it's really important that this is included in the contracts moving forward. We also know that demand has increased and will continue to increase. It is our understanding that nonprofit home deliver meal providers have been asked to refer clients to get food rather than continuing to enroll clients into this program um, due to a lack of funding. So we really would love to see this program be supported and given the financial resources needed to continue to enroll clients that are deemed eligible by the case management agencies. Um, we also really want to emphasize the need for a smooth transition from old contracts to new contracts, as well as any transitions from get food clients to home delivered meals or towards the end of get food, whenever that might be. We need a smooth transition to make sure all older I'm adults inspired. are served and have their needs met into the future. Thank you for the opportunity to testify. Thank you, Caitlin. We will now be hearing from Tara Klein from United Neighborhood Houses. Starting time. Thank you so much, Chair Chen, for the opportunity to testify today. My name is Tara Klein. I'm a policy analyst with United Neighborhood Houses, a policy and social change organization representing 44 neighborhood settlement houses. Eight UNH settlement houses uh, currently provide home delivered meals either as lead contractors or subcontractors. During COVID-19, the HDM program saw demand increase rapidly with many indicating a 20 to 30% uptick in demand as urgent community needs grew. New awards were recently announced for the HDM RFP. We remain very concerned that this RFP proceeded in the midst of a global pandemic that has significantly strained programs and created major uncertainty about the future of programming and participation levels. The COVID-19 pandemic is not the time for the city to release any new procurement that envisions services for years to come. And DIFTA should heed this call as it proceeds with several other procurements, including older adult centers. But here we are. So now we need to build the strongest HDM system that we can. Despite its overwhelming success in maintaining health and nutrition, the HDM program has been significantly underfunded for years with DIFTA contracts failing to cover the full cost of providing meals. Before the pandemic, some providers individually reported losing hundreds of thousands of dollars each year on their contracts, which has only been made more acute by the increased demand during COVID. 
This underfunding undercuts the quality and availability of services for the older adults who rely on these meals. The city failed to invest any new funding in the program this year, and as we heard earlier, even eliminated the $2.84 million in annually recurring one-shot funding. All this while the RP included several programmatic changes to increase meal choice that add more costs. Um, as we just heard, DIPTA's new per meal reimbursement rate is 20% less than the national average cost of a home delivered meal of 1178. And an independent analysis by UNH and Live On in partnership with Sea Change Capital Partners has confirmed that this 1178 rate is close to the true cost of a meal in New York City. In addition to these low rates, which urgently must be increased, simple math shows us that DIPTA's new per meal reimbursement rate and the $40 million of annual funding available as listed in the RFP is not even enough to meet the current number of meals served. Something needs to be done to correct course here. Either the city needs to add $4 million just to meet the needs of its own, the terms of its own procurement, or contractors are going to be forced to reduce the number of meals they serve each year by 418,000 meals, which would deny much needed food and social services to older New Yorkers in need. The city must increase funding along with its per meal rate in order to make the home delivered meals program whole. It must also include annual cost escalators and contracts, invest in a capital fund for programs and reverse the cut to the indirect cost rate initiative. We urge the city to look to new federal funding sources as they become available to support the program, but absent of this, the city I'm must fired. increase its own investment into the program. Thank you so much for the opportunity to testify and I'm happy to answer questions. Thank you, Tyra. We will now be hearing from Kevin Jones from AARP. Starting time. Good morning, Chair Chin and members of the Committee on Aging. My name is Kevin Jones and I'm the Associate State Director of Advocacy at AARP New York, which represents 750,000 members age 50 and older in New York City. I wanna thank you for the opportunity to testify today about the future of home delivered meals and for recognizing how many older residents depend on them to stay healthy and fed. Those age 50 and older account for nearly a third of our population, a number that's likely to increase by 30% by 2040. They are among the most susceptible to COVID-19, particularly older New Yorkers of color who have been hit at a disproportionately high rate. They are also far more likely than their white peers to suffer from economic insecurity, making it harder to put food on the table. AARP's Disru Disrupting Racial and Ethnic Disparities reports found that pocketbook issues are the greatest source of stress fa facing older residents and that financial hardships are felt most acutely by our aging African-American, Hispanic, and Asian-American residents. Before the pandemic, nearly 1 million New York uh, City residents were food insecure, including one in 10 older New Yorkers. That number has now spiked to over 2.2 million or roughly 25% of the population. Older New Yorkers must not only have an adequate amount of food that provides the right nutrients, it must also be culturally competent. That is why we support resolution 112-2018, which calls on the Department for the Aging to uh, ensure that halal meals are available as part of the home delivered meals program. Many meals are provided by nonprofit senior serving organizations that shoulder uh, much of the cost because of the gap between what the city pays per home delivered meal and the actual cost of that meal. With nonprofits also suffering financially, we worry that it's going to be even harder, if not impossible for them to continue providing this essential service. That's why we must have a robust and well-funded home delivered meal program, including adequate funding for senior serving organizations to help older adults through the recovery and beyond. Senior centers, which are currently closed, combat both food insecurity and isolation by providing meals and offering opportunities for socialization. Even before the pandemic, older adults were more likely to experience loneliness social, and social isolation, which can be as damaging to one's health as smoking 15 cigarettes a day. According to a report by AARP and United Health Foundation, we are now facing or uh, experiencing a loneliness epidemic with two thirds of adults age 50 and older reporting feeling isolated since the onset of the pandemic. Senior centers also give staffers a great ability to check on the welfare of those they serve. These are, uh, there are certain things that you just can't do through a phone call or video conference. For example, staff have an easier time telling if someone has lost a significant amount of weight or perhaps have not been eating enough or if the state of their clothing indicates that they have trouble completing household chores. If someone doesn't show up who usually does, that's also a sign that something may be wrong. That's why we encourage the city to develop a set of standards available for public review for the safe reopening of congregate meals and senior centers, grab and go meals, which may allow for appropriate social distancing could be a, a potential first step. 
Food insecurity among older New Yorkers has been a problem for a long time and the pandemic has made it worse. Thank you for allowing me the opportunity to speak about how we can address this now and in the future. And I am happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you, Kevin. Just, I just want to remind council members, if you have any questions for this panel, please use the raise their hand function on Zoom. No, I just wanted to thank this uh, panel for your, your testimony and for your, your advocacy. Um, it just shows that we need to advocate for more funding, especially um, in the next budget. And, and that process starts, you know, in a, in a couple of months. And so we, we need to prepare uh, to continue to push on the indirect costs and, and increasing the meal program. Because I remember the commissioner uh, talking about early on that, um, you know, they want the home delivery meal program to be intact. And that's why it, it was separated uh, from the Get Food program. But that program needs the resources. And when we talk about, you know, five meals a day versus six meals a day uh, a week um, or seven meals a week, I mean, that's something that we have to continue to look for uh, to make sure that um, the seniors' needs are met. And we know that the funding has always been the problem. And that is something that we just have to, to continue to fight uh, to include in the budget. But I just wanted to uh, thank this panel uh, for all your great work. Thank you, Chair. You. Thank you, Chair. I see Councilmember Vallone has questions for this panel. Councilmember Vallone. Starting time. I to echo the Chair's comments with Caitlin and Tara and Kevin. Thank you so much. We always do listen to your words and your concerns. And it's a big part of how we shape our questions and conferences over seven years now. Uh, Mighty Margaret, as we call her and ourselves and myself have been the, 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 the Batman and Robin team. And we, we really do uh, appreciate, especially now with the virtual setup, you know, it's a little bit more, uh, I guess, challenging to have those personal follow-ups. So your, your words today, we will follow up and you hear our questions. So if there's ever something you want us to follow up on, um, maybe you can help me. There was, the, there was some type of call that I think had stopped. It, was it the, is it the get food call? that the provider, I think that's the one. So maybe we can help with the commission and get back to her because it seems like the, our local providers are telling me that that phone call and that DIFTA uh, update has stopped. Have, have you heard anything on that also? Um, yes, I believe that the um, get food call might have paused for a period of time. And we had a recent conversation with the um, with Kate McKenzie and are really hopeful that we'll be able to get something back on the calendar specifically because the get the get food monthly calls, um, they were on all get food uh, services, not specific to older adults, though it certainly covered that to a large extent. Um, but we are in conversation with Kate McKenzie's team to see if we can um, discuss having a meeting specific for the needs of older adults um, who are receiving get food and have providers continue to hear because they certainly do appreciate those meetings. And do you see any um, challenge, I guess, with the transition from get food, I guess, between the legacy and the new and the, the request maybe for seniors beyond food for additional services, are, are those being met or are we finding a new challenge with seniors looking for those needs beyond just the meal program? And that would be my last. Sure. I think the good news is that we now are aware of a whole new cohort of older adults that this system might not have previously been interacting with. And um, maybe the pandemic allowed more older adults to be comfortable to share their needs that might have existed prior um, to all of this. And so that's really positive. And I certainly hope that we can continue to engage the older adults to make sure that they're receiving SCREE and all of the benefits that they might be entitled to, as well as determine if there are additional supports that might be necessary. Um, I'm sure there could be an opportunity for conversations with providers, the Department for the Aging, um, the food team, 
and figure out how we can best assess those needs and prepare the supports um, to make sure they're in place. And I think certainly making the connections for the non-legacy clients to their local senior center, if they might not have been aware previously that that center is around, um, that would be great to do a warm handoff introduction to the services, tell them about the virtual programming and really show them what New York has to offer. Yeah, I think that's an opportunity we can use then to reintroduce them to maybe for the first time, like you said, it's a new, it's a new wave of folks that are coming for the first time. So they may not even be aware of right. screen degree and all that. So thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. I would also just add and underscore that um, around May, DIFTA did tell providers, home delivered meal providers to stop signing up new clients and to refer those clients to get food. And because of that, that there were social service needs that were un unaddressed. Um, because they were not able to receive the case management services and the daily wellness checks that come with the, the HDM program. And so while there were still wellness calls happening, you, you know, the, the depth of service that happens from the home delivered meals program, that was really lost for those people who might have needed it. Um, and so that does remain a concern as well. Has that continued at any point or is it still not happening? I believe it's still, it's still sort of frozen is my That's understanding. That's, that's not good. All right, we'll have to follow up on that. Thank you, Madam Chair. Yeah, I mean, like the commission was saying that, um, you know, the provider don't have the capacity. And, uh, but you have to help them build the capacity. Because that was the first question back then. It's like, we have a home delivery meal program. Why don't we just sign these the seniors up and connect them? And uh, the, the whole conversation was, oh, we just want to make sure that the home deliver meal program, you know, stay as it is, like don't get interrupted or whatever. And then everybody got uh, channeled into the, the get food program. But the other thing that I raised earlier, a lot of that population uh, could have been the population that went to the social adult daycare. Uh, so we don't know going forward if those uh, SAG is going to open back up. Um, it doesn't seem like anytime soon. So these seniors still need the service and, and, we, and it'll be a good opportunity for them to get connected back to the regular seniors who are providing uh, senior centers who are providing you know, lots of program even during the pandemic, uh, virtual programs and, and other important you know, wellness check. Uh, so we'll definitely continue to, to advocate for that. And thank you again to this panel. Thank you to this panel. We will now be calling on the next panel. Ravi Reddy from the Asian American Federation, Sharanya Pali Pili, sorry, from the India House, Christelle Simon Simmons from the Isaac Center, and Rachel Sherrell from City Mills on Wheels. We will be starting with Ravi from the Asian American Federation. Starting time. I want to thank Committee Chair Chin and Council Members Ayala, Diaz, Vallone, Eugene, Traeger, and Deutsch for holding this hearing. I'm Ravi Reddy, the Associate Director of Advocacy and Policy at the Asian American Federation. We represent the collective voice of more than 70 nonprofits serving 1.3 million New York, Asian New Yorkers. The challenges our service providers are facing in providing for our seniors are significant, including high rates of poverty and limited English proficiency, lack of immigration status, the digital divide, and anti-Asian xenophobia, as was tragically demonstrated in the case of an 89-year-old Asian elder who was set on fire in Brooklyn in late July. We're appreciative of the continued efforts being made by DIFTA and this committee, but we're here on behalf of community-based organizations that are doing on-the-ground work in order to make real the urgency. First, two trends will define the challenge facing our senior meal service providers in the near future. One, rising demand as more seniors remain homebound and vigilant against the danger posed to them, and two, an expanding increasingly diverse and dispersed Asian senior population across our city. From 2000 to 2018, the Asian senior population in our city more than doubled. There are now over 150,000 Asian seniors living here, making up 16% of our over 50 population. Among Asian seniors, one in four in our city live in poverty, 83% of whom were LEP, almost twice the rate for non-Asians. And our seniors are helping create new Asian communities in places such as Parkchester and East Harlem. In this context, many CBOs who are the sole service providers for certain ethnic communities are struggling to cover the expanding 
providing map of service demand without the necessary funding. But our seniors are going to our CBOs before they go to mainstream providers or city agencies in large part due to culturally competent services and innovations. For example, while many senior centers and service providers are not able to meet the volume of need, they're coordinating with local restaurants to deliver culturally competent meals, stock food and pantries, and build relationships with produce suppliers familiar with Asian diets. Our CBOs are also incorporating mental health checks and embedding wellness interventions into these basic need services because one thing is clear, individual services are better received and utilized when delivered together. But these innovations by our service providers are born out of necessity. From 2002 to 2014, our analysis showed that the Asian American share of DIFTA funding was 2.7% of total contract dollars and 3.7% of the total number of contracts. These numbers were from over a decade of data, and they reflect a long-term trend that has resulted in our CBOs becoming increasingly dependent on private funds. The cumulative effect of this funding vulnerability can't be ignored during a pandemic, and whether we can keep our seniors fed through the winter is an urgent, uncomfortable, open question. Question. But as Councilmember Chin said earlier, we have to continue the fight. Our service providers in our community are working together to build internal structures that include umbrella organizations that have the expertise in coordinating with member nonprofits to be innovative in sourcing culturally appropriate meals and have the community buy-in to hit the ground running with existing relationships. Still, city contracting processes have left these critical actors out. Our service providers are leading by example what they need from our city. I just have a couple recommendations. We need to continue funding for the Senior Centers for Immigrant Populations Initiative at $1.5 million to support Asian senior centers in both existing and emerging neighborhoods. We need to raise reimbursement rates, as was previously referred, for ethnic home delivered meals and temporarily allow concrete meal contractors to run home delivered meal services as long as it's needed, especially as it will allow groups to continue to reach seniors who were homebound prior to COVID and will remain so due to physical limitations. We need to address the growing need for in language culturally competent health care and mental health services for Asian seniors. We need to amend contracting processes to allow Asian-led nonprofits to more accurately reflect the cultural and language expertise they bring when serving Asian seniors. We need to establish protections for subcontractors or restructure contracts to enable Asian senior centers to contract direct, directly with the city for homebound meals. And finally, we need to ensure that DIFTA receives the funding they need to fully implement the new citywide languages covered in Local Law 30. I want to thank you for your test for giving me the opportunity to provide testimony and uh, I await any questions. Thank you, Ravi. We will now be hearing from Shivanya from the India House. Starting time. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Margaretin and the Committee on Aging for the opportunity to testify today. My name is Sharanya Pule, and I'm testifying from India Home, a community organization that has dedicated our heart and soul towards serving South Asian senior community in Queens and throughout New York City with culturally competent senior center programming. During this pandemic, I'm proud to say we did not stop any of our programs. We pivoted and we continue to serve in as many ways as possible creatively, and we're having more of a reach than we ever have before. Since the start of the pandemic, we have delivered more than 11,000 meals, delivered groceries to more than 900 seniors, and provided more than 18,000 telephone reassurance check-ins and more than 17,000 service units through educational talks, nutrition talks, yoga, meditation, exercise, ESL, citizenship classes, among many other classes. To take a step back, in 2017, we conducted a needs assessment which focused on the needs of the South Asian senior community throughout New York City. When assessing economic priorities for this population, food and grocery were of top importance. We acknowledge this and tailored our program accordingly, even before the pandemic started. When the pandemic came upon us and took over Queens in mid-March, we continued to be in tune with the needs of the seniors during this time, of which food insecurity was still the biggest concern. We knew that the senior population was especially vulnerable to contracting COVID-19 and that we cannot take the risk of making them go outside to get food even though the grab, even through the grab and go method, which was proposed and which we tried for a day and it did not go well. <laughs> Many of these seniors were dependent on our senior centers for the only nutritious meals that they had. Many of our seniors cannot afford to go out and get meals both financially and in terms of their health. Despite this program not being funded by DEFTA, we continue to fight for nutritious, culturally competent meals for these seniors as a basic right. We started our own culturally competent home delivered meal program and grocery program which again has delivered more than 11,000 meals and groceries to more than 900 seniors. 
We're working directly with a local caterer who serves halal meals in the Bangladeshi style of cooking and deli delivers the meals to the safety of the seniors' homes. While this has been incredibly fulfilling to provide this program during this incredibly difficult time, it has not come without its own challenges. We have been scrambling for funding and are fully dependent on the funding from foundations and the generosity of individual donors during this time for this program. We were directed to get Food NYC as a solution and told to direct all of our seniors to this program, but this program has lacked cultural competence as has lacked quality. Our seniors have, have told us about the state of the meals delivered through this program, and it is truly unacceptable. I think we can all agree that our seniors deserve better. They don't deserve the same treatment that our organization's founder was told by conventional senior programs before 10 years ago. We don't have curry for your father. When our seniors are not prioritized or heard, it is our job to speak up for them and advocate for them. And so we have to speak up on the continued importance of local organizations with cultural competence and knowledge of these populations to be the ones delivering the meals I'm to these inspired. seniors. We have shown that nothing will stop our dedication to the provision of meals to vulnerable seniors, and we ask that the city do the same. While we are temporarily able to run with the help of private do donations, we need the city's help to be able to sustain this program and to continue to provide and prioritize culturally competent services. As such, we ask that the city provide support to grassroots organizations such as India Home with resources and funding to better serve and stabilize the immigrant Asian community. We ask that you prioritize food security and the COVID-19 response for seniors in a demonstrable way. We ask that you work directly with local nonprofits to handle the provision and delivery of meals so that cultural competence is ensured. And we ask that you provide funding for these local organizations to be able to continue to meet food security needs of this population. We urge your support and look forward to working together to stabilize this community. Thank you. Thank you. We will now hear from Christelle from Isaac Center. Starting time. Thank you, Chair Chin, for this time to testify. My name is Crystal Simmons. I'm the Director of Food and Nutrition Services at Stanley Isaacs Neighborhood Center, overseeing the home delivery meals program, congregate lunch program for older adults. I have had the pleasure of being an HDM director for 11 years now. I have observed key policy and budgetary decisions impacting both older adults and human service professionals being made by our city and state government entities with little to no discourse or opportunities for meaningful partnerships with those utilizing the services, as well as those employed within the sector. In March of 2020, without a clear blueprint of how to proceed, the human services sector worked tirelessly to ensure both service continuity and expansion to accommodate rapidly growing needs across the city. The HDM program is not only a meal delivery program, it is a lifeline to the seniors of New York City, to those who work to build its very foundation. In March of 2020, without a clear blueprint of how to proceed, the human services worked, worked tirelessly to ensure, as I said before. We know that seniors are amongst the most vulnerable and disproportionately impacted throughout this public health crisis. Since the onset of the pandemic, the Isaac Center Meals on Wheels program has been at the forefront of feeding New York City's most underrepresented and oppressed population. The Isaac Center created, funded, and adopted a community kitchen model to deliver additional meals to our seniors who needed them. This included Meals on Wheels recipients, senior center members, and congregates, and our elderly neighbors in need. The Get Food program has been made more difficult and time consuming for seniors to re-register and stay on the program. The burden for keeping seniors on the program has largely fallen on the senior centers already stretched to meet the growing needs of our members stuck at home. But the reality is that until senior centers resource to begin cooking and distributing meals, there is not going to be a significant reduction in the need for Get Food. We ask for the aging committee's help and advocacy to release funding for senior centers, such as ours to cook grab and go meals. Further, it was extremely disheartening to learn of no restoration or baselining of one time prior year funding from both the council and DIFTA for the current fiscal years. We ask for the aging committee's help and advocacy to restore and baseline this one time funding from DIFTA, particularly as need continues to grow until the COVID-10 crisis is behind us. Thank you to the Committee on Aging for holding this important hearing and the opportunity to, to submit testimony. Thank you. Thank you. We will now hear from Rachel from City Mills on Wheels. Starting Thank time. You. Uh, my name is Rachel Sherrill. I'm the Associate Executive Director at City Meals on Wheels. And I would 
really like to begin by thanking the council and especially Chair Chin for her dedication to advocating for more support of senior services and for City Meals as well. Just to clarify, um, City Meals on Wheels funds weekend holiday and emergency meals um, to the providers. And that's why older adults in their homes get food seven days a week. Um, I'd like to also say, uh, reiterate the fact that City Meals along with our partners and advocates that who you've heard from have been consistently lobbying for the support of aging services, which are continually underfunded despite the growing population of older adults and especially while we're in the midst of a pandemic. While money has been found for other services, aging funding has been held stagnant or worse. The daily home delivered meals program throughout the city along with support from city meals remained seamless even when the city shut down services throughout because of COVID. As a sector, aging, aging providers have always known how critical our services are, but not more so than in the current environment when Meals on Wheels staff are literally essential workers, ensuring their recipients are not without food and a friendly face, risking their own lives to maintain a lifeline for our elderly neighbors. The check-in can be almost as important as the nutritious meals. The social, social isolation, which was an issue before the pandemic has devastated this population, acutely without a known end date in sight, unable to socialize or even see family, afraid of infecting those in the most vulnerable group. Uh, although the, the uh, HDML awardees have not been confirmed by DIFTA, we do know that a big part of the RFP was to ensure quality of meals, menu choice, and cultural competency. Home delivered meals are integral to the survival and part of the larger safety net that has been underfunded and underinvested in over the years. And now when the Meals on Wheels roles have increased, even if they are coming down, as the commissioner stated, they, are, um, they will continue to grow. It's imperative for those in need to receive extra supplemental food in addition to their daily meals because accessing other means of nutrition is less possible now for most of them. In addition to being a moral obligation, Meals on Meals is a cheaper alternative to institutionalization, more dignified, and what the majority of older adults prefer, especially in light of the current devastation of life within nursing homes by the coronavirus. I thank you for the opportunity and I, I really hope that we'll be able to write this uh, aging ship in the next couple of years. Thank you. Thank you, Rachel. That concludes this panel, but if any council members have any questions for this panel, please use the Zoom raise your hand function. Yes, I wanted to you know, thank this uh, panel. Uh, for your advocacy and and especially the one who's you know on the ground providing um, the services, I know that at the council we continue uh, to advocate for the funding uh, for center that serves senior, uh, I mean immigrant senior population, and there's ten of them, and this year we fought against any cut, so they're still getting um, the same amount of funding that they have gotten before, which is 150 thousand. Um, and hopefully, you know, we can continue um, to help increase that funding. And one of the purpose uh, of that funding is to really help these center uh, build their capacity so that they will be prepared um, to apply for the senior center RFP when it's going to be available. Uh, so I just want to, like, in the home, I, I wanted to ask, like, were you? contacted by DIFTA with any kind of uh, support? And did you have an opportunity to look at um, the senior center concept paper and see if that if India Home will have uh, the resources and capacity uh, to apply when the RFP is available? I mean, we're trying to push it back because there's all these uncertainties, but were you able to look at uh, and review the concept paper? Yes, definitely. Um, we, we did take a look at the concept paper and we will be applying for, for this program. I mean, we um, we do believe like it's, it, it's very needed for us and this amount of support from DEFTA would be, um, you know, really helpful with the amount of reach that we've been able to achieve at this time. Um, your earlier question, could you just repeat your earlier question? I think I um, lost track. Oh, I mean, like the, we're still continuing to provide funding. Uh, for the senior center that serve the immigrant population. 
I think India Home is, is one of the, uh, the center that we support. There's 10 of them uh, that the council support. So I hope that you know about the funding and you're able to access the, the resources. Um, have you been having, I guess, any problem in terms of getting um, the contract signed or, or you know, accessing the funding uh, from DIFTA? For sure. Um, it was during the, the transition, I think that, you know, we were, we were directed to having our seniors um, that, that our own meals would not be the ones that with our local caterer would not be funded by discretionary dollars. Um, I know that for this program, this has been our most robust program. And um, as such, you know, we, we just need to uh, be able to get more support specifically for this program, providing the services. So um, we just, we, we need that support to be able to, you know, be funded for this program, which is needed by our seniors. Oh, you've been going, yeah, going in and out. I guess, were you, was India Home a subcontractor to any <coughs> home to home delivery meal contractor in Queens or, or in we, another part of the We city? were not, um, we were contracted with, um, so basically DEFTA contracted directly with our caterer when the home delivered meals happened. First they were contracted with us, then it was with the caterer and then after that get food NYC was um, so that was kind of the process um, that happened, but yeah. I, I guess we'll, we'll find out more detail from DIFTA in terms of how these 10 centers uh, were taken care of. I just wanna make sure that they know that the funding uh, was allocated I and mean, we fought for it. Uh, and that's supposed to have start July 1st. So I wanna make sure that uh, you get, you know, the, the money uh, to support your staff and. The, and uh, the services that that you provide, um, Rachel. I, I wanted you to uh, talk a little bit more about uh, um, City Meals on Wheel because uh, you're the one that provides the emergency meal, the weekend meal. Uh, it so you have a contract with DIFTA to do that. Yes, we have a contract with DIFTA um, to provide uh, to leverage our fundraising in order to provide weekend holiday and emergency meals. So we have a small administrative grant that we've had, it's the same amount since 1991, um, but we do have other monies that go through DIFTA because of your incredible generosity um, for emergency meals. And since the beginning of the pandemic, we have delivered over 750,000 emergency meals. And a lot of that came, uh, was in reaction to the um, need to fill the gap that get food wasn't, and because the system had shut down, legacy clients were uh, allowed to continue their services, but there was no, as Tara mentioned before, um, they weren't allowed to take on additional clients. I mean, shouldn't the DIFTA expand uh, funding support for City Meals on Wheel? I mean, like you're providing that, that sixth and seventh meal. I mean, it's like DIFTA is only providing five meals a week and early on we we're talking about, you know, one meal a day for the senior, is that sufficient? Um, the seven days in a week. Uh, so if, if your funding hasn't increased since 1991, I mean- Our administrative like, grant, right, uh, right. No, it's, yeah, we, uh, that would be terrific to, uh, to increase it. And I know now, you know, things are, are pretty rough, but we also know that it's so much cheaper to keep someone in their homes than, into, than institutionalize them, whether you like Meals on Wheels or not. Um, and it's a, a wonderful program, it's a safety net, and it has been underfunded for years. And because of City Meals on Wheels, 18,000 to about 19,000 homebound elderly are able to receive food on weekends, holidays, and emergencies. So they have enough food 365 days a year plus some. Uh, some of our clients, about 14% we know need an additional meal. The one meal a day is not enough. So we have a small program where we bring 
um, more food to their homes. About a thousand clients are getting that, but that's not enough. And especially mm -hmm. now when folks maybe could have gone out to their local deli or store, they're just not doing that now. Mm -hmm. Yes, and no, we thank you for the, the great work you've been doing. And I know that we see the city meal boxes um, <laughs> throughout districts and throughout our other uh, council members uh, district. Um, I think Ms. Simmon from uh, Isaac Center, I mean, you guys are on the ground. Um, I know earlier when we talked with uh, the commissioner, mm -hmm. are, are you guys ready to go to start preparing the, the food again for the seniors that you've been serving all along? Get them back into your program? Yes, uh, but... Um just for the record, we have been cooking for our home delivery meals program since March. Mm -hmm. We started with our frozen meals and in August of this year, we started preparing our hot meals. So we're cooking and distributing about 3,500 meals a week out from our kitchen, safely, of course. But that's from the, the home delivery meal. That's for the home so delivery meal. Yeah, so, yes, so that's not that's, your congregate meal. No, uh, but that's why seniors. we believe, right, that's why we believe that we are more than prepared and ready, but we are asking for, you know, the funding to do so. Yeah, yeah, because there are a lot of other uh, centers uh, like yourself. Are you a subcontractor? Uh, so we're the so we're the lead contract oh. for home delivery meals and our subcontractor is Union Settlement and Carter Burden. Oh, Okay. Yeah, because there are a lot of senior centers that are subcontractors right. because they do home delivered meal. And so they're already still, they're already cooking. So it doesn't, you know, it makes sense for them to, to start cooking for the, the client who used to come to the center. Mm -hmm. And if not, if, if the city won't allow the center to grab and go, then deliver. to to include back all the the senior center providers um in the meal program mm -hmm. but thank you again for your your testimony thank you kalima you want to call the next panel yes i first i'll call on councilmember valon i see he has his hands raised thank you chair starting time just quickly wanted to thank this panel just like all the panels so you know as our chair said how how much we depend on you, your services, your advice. Um, you, you heard our testimony throughout, especially in the commissioner and the previous panel. I just, last thought for me was anything else you wanted to add on that transition? Seems to be there, there's a little maybe of a disconnect between DIFTA and the get food and the legacy versus the new, um, I guess the, the upkeep of the new seniors that are now partaking of the services and considered new versus legacy. Are, are you having any additional difficulty or concern there as we are continuing through this get food program and maybe hopefully transition off. So of course, with, with all programs, there are always going to be um, a lot of issues. I would say that the one of the main issues that stand, stand out between the Get Food Program and the Home Delivered Meals Program is for our Meals on Wheels program, we can start sending a meal within 24 hours versus the Get Food from the time a person is referred. It takes about three to four days before they even start receiving a box. That's a big difference. That's a, it's a very, very big difference. And of course, the, you know, the accommodation. So we have clients that don't eat pork or beef and we, we have the luxury of um, changing out a meal or we have vegetarian meals as well. We have kosher meals. We're hoping to ha start having halal meals soon. So that's the difference, like I said, between home delivery meals and get food. Has there been any conversation of bringing that down from three to four days back to a day? I mean, how are we? There's been a lot of there's been a lot of conversations, but because there's you know you always have that I guess the third party. So the senior center social workers and my colleague who's the clinical director Aaron Rooney. I mean, he can he will refer a client, but like I said, it takes the turnaround time is too long. And there are some people, some seniors that call and say, "Well, I don't have anything right now. What are we supposed to do?" So that's exactly. why. So that's how we ended up in the summertime 
um, with our community kitchen model because of that very issue with get food. And the community um, kitchen model was something, a model that we created, we, we funded, and we also delivered the meals to the clients in the community. And these were mostly congregate clients and very few home delivered meals clients that asked for an extra meal. Because as you know, home delivered meals, it's only one meal a day. And I know you and I eat more than once a day. Uh, right. So luckily, you know, we had that option, but we weren't, we haven't been able to um, continue with our community kitchen model because we don't have the funding for it. So there may be an opportunity there with that community kitchen model and I don't see any changes in the crisis coming and it's probably going to increase in demand. So maybe we can put our heads together after today's hearing on this private partnership with the nonprofits and the ability, whether it's through fundraising or the immediate ability of providing food, uh, the restaurant industry as itself is already um, collapsing. But if we can bridge this gap between the providing of the food, getting it to you to get to the seniors before that three, four day and immediate turnaround, there may be something we can do on our, within this network of people we're talking to, to step up. And I see Rachel, you're shaking your yes. head. Can I, do, I just want to add, and I said this in my last, uh, the last hearing, my last testimony, it would be so great to get the experts who are actually in the field, like Crystal, who are doing this every day, who know their communities and have been doing this for so long, to give their, um, their advice and for there to be a little more transparency around what is the plan, if there is a plan, because as Crystal said, it, it, it takes a while to set things up. They could pivot and, and deliver. I know they can. I know them very well to their congregate members, but they have to have funding and they have to have a support and the plan. And I think that's what's really been missing. So that would be great to continue that. Yeah, I think we're onto something. That's why I always like to talk to the panels because Margaret and I always, you know, as we always say it, my, my my goosebumps are up and my my brain is already whirling on trying to combine those, the angels that are out there who do have the funding, who do want to make an ascent, don't know how, to yes. get them to exactly to 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 you and to Crystal, because you already, there's no, to reinvent the wheel doesn't need to be done. It's just need to, to fund the wheel. It's already yes. in place. It's the funding that we need. So maybe then Crystal, we can follow up with this group through Margaret's leadership on how to do that within the counties too, right? So each county has their ability to know their resource needs and their groups uh, and then break it down through the councilmatic districts. We all have, I have a huge senior population out here in Northeast Queens and we're so diverse and so geographically located to our homes that we're so dependent on that meal delivery that, um, I mean, I go from City Field to Nassau County. It's insane. So I'm inspired. What's that? I'm so excited to follow up. Thank you, Madam. Thank you. Thank you. I look forward to hearing from you. Thank you. Yeah, I think, yeah, I think we will have committee staff follow up uh, with some of the panelists, you know. Chair Chin, you're breaking up a little. You know, so just the idea like you talk about buying some funding. Oh, yeah. I mean, we can uh, if to see it, if there's. Oh, okay. Yeah, I want the committee staff uh, to follow up uh, with some of the panelists and please reach out and give us your suggestions and you know what you've been doing and what would be helpful. And we will look for additional. Uh, resources, if there might be fundings available, like certain program that are not running, fundings not being used, and then maybe we can uh, reallocate. But definitely in the next budget fight, um, we will, you know, make sure um, that that home delivered meal and, and senior center providers get the resources that they need. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you to this panel. This concludes the panelists for today, but however, if we had inadvertently missed anyone that would like to testify, please use the Zoom raise hand function and we will call you in the order your hand is raised. Seeing none, we have concluded public testimony for this hearing. I will now turn it back to Chair Chen for some closing remarks. Uh, once again, I wanted to thank you, uh, 
everyone for joining us today, everyone, uh, Tessa and my colleague, especially uh, Council Member Valon, my partner in this, and uh, and all the staff that work on preparing for this hearing, and all the sergeant at arms that are, are helping support this hearing. And uh, we will continue uh, to fight for more resources for our older adult population in New York City. And we look forward to continue to work with all the advocates and, and all the providers and we want everyone to uh, stay well um, and please get the message out that we all got to vote on November 3rd and that we will fight for more adequate funding. It's going to be fun next year. <laughs> okay. And uh, we thank you again for all your great work. This concludes our hearing for today.